have the look of the devil, Townsend. Is that right? All we got out here is blind orders and chance. Which you'll do for us first, you reckon? I'm sick of your whip, McManus. Aye, aye, sir. It will start it up. So. Back and up. Oh, Big Miss. <laughs> Give us a break. Give us a break. Come on. Ah, come on, Miss. Come on. Stop. Stop, Big Miss. Stop. Stop. It stopped. Are you just going to stand there? I can't see more than 20 yards. We're pushing through. Edwards, I'll drive. You jump out and scout ahead. Don't be a hero, lad. Just do your job. Hello, Warfighters. War is hell. Welcome to the next episode of the series where we're talking about the history of World War I and how it ties in to Battlefield 1. This campaign is amazing, but I think you're going to get a lot more out of it if you understand the history behind some of it too. Because you can watch just about anybody and they'll kind of go through the commentary of how they're playing the game and everything, but you know, I just love the history aspect. And hopefully that kind of comes through. Uh, in the past we've done you know some videos that talk about some specific things, like episode one was the Harlem Hellfighters, episode two was tanks. Now this one's gonna be a little bit more broad. We're gonna be talking about how tactics changed during World War One, and kind of how we've gotten to fighting warfare is like what you're seeing here in this video. Uh, I like to study war. Again, I hope that comes through in the videos and every single war represents something a little bit different for me and they interest me uh, or different wars interest me for different reasons. Like World War II, I just love the battles. Battle of Midway is a phenomenal uh, battle to study. Operation Market Garden, D-Day, of course. You know, you can look at stuff that took place in the North African campaign. There's a lot of great stuff there, but for me, the thing that interests me about World War I, it's not so much the battles, and I'm not saying, like, you know, the battles aren't worth studying. They definitely are, and I'll actually talk about a few of them here in this video. But for me, the thing that interests me is how World War I has impacted the world today. You know, a lot of the components of modern warfare started with World War I. Like, we're still using tanks today, obviously. You know, that being first used in World War I is just one of many examples on how World War I has influenced warfare today. Um, a lot of people will say World War II is the most influential war on the current geopolitical landscape, the issues that exist between nations uh, and regions of the world. However, uh, I do believe that World War II in many aspects is just a continuation of World War One, and so I will say that World War One is the most influential war on our current geopolitical landscape and issues that exist around the world. Uh, a lot of stuff has kind of come from that, both good and bad, you know, depending on what you look at and what side of history that you're on. The bullet that killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand by far, in my opinion, has done more to change the world, again, both good and bad, than any other bullet or any other event uh, in the last, gosh, 150 years. So, as we talk about the tactics of World War One, it's really interesting to see how much it had changed throughout World War One. War was not fought the same way in 1914 as it was in 1918, and I think there's a, the largest discrepancy ever uh, in such a short amount of time on how war was fought. I think what it illustrates, too, is that the side that's going to win one of the things that they're likely going to have going for them is that they were uh, the first to embrace some type of technology and be able to put it on the battlefield faster than their enemy could. And so we see a lot of things, uh, you know, aircraft, tanks, um, even using artillery in a way that, or uh, 
you know, counter battery fire that's based off of the location of the sound of an enemy artillery piece. Like they would set up microphones in different parts of the battlefield and these microphones would get the same sound, but because sound travels, uh, you know, at a speed that can be easily measured, you could triangulate the position of that artillery piece based off of multiple microphones picking up the same sound and when they receive that sound. Uh, just a lot of cool stuff that took place in there. So, 1914, as I was mentioning, very different uh, warfare than we saw in 1918. So, I read a book a long, I shouldn't say a long time ago, um, you know, a few years back called The Guns of August. And it is, hands down, one of my favorite military history books. I think it very clearly lays out exactly what took place before World War I that kind of created the hostility between these nations. And it also discusses the first month of the war. Very brief summary, but I'll talk about it more in a future video. So, in 1914, the nations were prepared for war and thought they would fight the war very differently. You, you look at Germany and the United Kingdom. They understood how shrapnel can really decimate your forces. Uh, you know, injuring, murdering, or not murdering, maiming, killing um, your own troops. And so, they wore helmets as part of their standard issue uniform. And then France really did not. You know, France, for the most part, had just cloth hats that they would wear, kind of similar to what you would see in, like, the American Civil War. Um, even France, you know, was behind when it came to how they dressed their soldiers, too, from the uniform. Germany wore gray. Uh, the UK wore khaki. And the British, or I'm sorry, the French, were still wearing bright red pants. The reason why they were wearing bright red pants is they thought it would inspire their troops. You know, as they were marching, they would look great. Um, you know, patriotic feelings, all of this. But if I'm trying to fight somebody in a, like, let's just say a forest area, I can see bright red pants pretty easily, and that's going to make them a very easy target. Uh, so France, even they very quickly made some adjustments on uh, the tactics they were using. They implemented camouflage. They went with... Uh, sky blue because they thought as their troops got up and out of the trenches and were running across no man's land if they were wearing sky blue uh, it would be difficult to spot them amongst the sky in the background as they were running so you know you can even go into more detail about like how the British hats were very easy to mass produce and the French were not because they were super complex anyway so over the course of you know, the war, things are changing, how they dress, how they fight, the tactics. You know, tactics in 1914 were, hey, there's a machine gun. Let's throw as many people at it until we take it out, which is actually, you know, a machine gun's really good at taking out large groups of people coming right at it. So that didn't go too well. Um, but, you know, when things really started settling down as far as the lines went and things became a lot more static with trench warfare, a lot of things really did change at that point. You know, how to break this stalemate was important. Now, trench warfare wasn't new in 1914. We uh, had seen uh, trench warfare exist in 1865 in the American Civil War when both the Confederates and the Union forces were dug in in Virginia. And even then, there's a great example of them not understanding how best to uh, use technology or new types of warfare to their advantage because, like, the Union at one point dug down underneath the Confederate lines. You know, they built this tunnel with a whole bunch of explosives and blew this giant hole in the Confederate lines. It's great that they were able to do that. I mean, that really enabled them to have an advantage, but it was quickly nullified by the fact that the Union, you know, some Union forces ran into this giant crater, found that they couldn't get out as opposed to going around the crater and, you know, Confederates just shot at them from the tops of the crater. World War I, you see a lot of stories that are kind of similar to that where the tactics didn't meet up with technology at the time. You asked me what wars I would not want to fight in. It's uh, World War I, hands down, the American Civil War, because those two, the tactics did not equate to the type of technology that was being used. So tanks, of course, are... Since we're in this part of the story, we're going to be talking about how that changed a lot, uh, too. Because how they were used at the very beginning of, you know, 
uh, their appearance in World War One and at the end was also very different. Uh, one battle that comes up as a very important part in the transition of the use of tanks is the Battle of Cambrai, the 1917 one. This one here takes place in 1918, the second Battle of Cambrai, which uh, I may hit on a little bit later. And so at this point of the war, you know, it's been going on for a long time. The lines have been basically the same, just changes by a few miles here in some large-scale battles, but really it's just a change by a few hundred meters as people take out different trenches and occupy them and they go back and forth. And so really trying to be able to break that stalemate was important, and that's why tanks were really brought to the forefront. And so in 1917, uh, the British are going up against the German Hindenburg Line. Now, the Hindenburg Line is one of the most stubborn defenses uh, that had ever been built up to that point. It was 40 miles long and uh, a few miles deep with tons of barbed wire, and it was going to be nearly impossible for any infantry to really be able to get up to the German lines in any type of effective force without alerting the, the Germans. And so there were a number of different plans that were put forth, but one plan called for uh, 387 tanks. Oh, 378. Sorry, I had that switched around. 378 tanks to push up uh, with infantry behind them to take out a lot of these defenses. And so there was a lot of planning about how these tanks would kind of get up uh, to the line without the Germans being alerted. And so the British would actually bring in aircraft, low altitude, which would make a lot of noise, and that wouldn't allow the Germans to be able to hear the tanks coming up to the line. But anyway, they did end up, you know, kind of know that something was going on. Uh, but on the 20th of November of 1917, 1,003 uh, artillery pieces uh, start shooting at the German lines and the tanks begin to move forward. There is smoke and a creeping barrage of 300 yards ahead of the infantry and the tanks as they moved up. So that way, like, it would keep the heads of the Germans down until they were right on top of them uh, until they got to the lines. Now, Germany at this point, the tank was nothing new to them. I mean, they had seen tanks before 1917, of course. And so one of the tactics that were being used to counter tanks was that the trenches were built wider. I think it was 14 feet uh, was one of the sizes of the trenches that were being dug and 20 feet deep. And so that would make it so when a trench or a tank got to a particular part of that trench, it would just go into the trench like it couldn't go across it. It was, it was too wide. And so what they did in this uh, battle is there was... Uh, wood bridges that were put on the front of the tanks so that they could just lay down and kind of go across the tanks. But what's interesting is once they broke through the German lines, they had done it a lot faster and better than anybody had really expected these tanks to be able to do alongside the infantry. And so supplying everybody and everything that was participating in the battle became very, very difficult. They'd have to send runners back from their front lines all the way back to the former British lines to kind of let them know, hey, we need supplies because communication had really not been figured out. Um, and so you have instances where tanks run out of fuel or ammunition. You know, infantry runs out of ammunition. And uh, the Battle of Cambrai could have been really, really uh, a lot more successful for the British than it ended up being because of these flaws. Now, what happens, too, is because uh, this happened so quickly that cavalry troops were ordered uh, quickly into the battle to try and exploit the holes that the tanks had made, which that just sounds really interesting to me. But again, that really shows just how much stuff had changed during World War I. You know, you've got cavalry and tanks fighting in the same battle. Cavalry are the ones who are exploiting the tanks' advantage. Anyway, so the first Battle of Cambrai was absolutely uh, a success as far as showing the potential of what tanks could do in mass with infantry. The overall objective, however, in the first Battle of Cambrai was not uh, successful or not completed because Cambrai was a uh, 
place where a lot of German headquarters staff was located. A lot of communication hubs went through Cambrai. And so taking out that city and the Germans that were there really could have paralyzed that part of the Western Front. However, weren't able to do that, of course. But uh, that really showed how tank warfare would be important. Fast forward on uh, a little bit to 1918, and at this point, the Americans had entered into the war. And Germany, you know, didn't really have an Eastern Front anymore since Russia had dropped out of the war because of the Communist Revolution. But they understood that time was not going for them. You know, time was against them because with America coming into the war, that was going to be a tremendous surge of fresh troops that would be added to the Western Front. And so in the uh, German offensive in the spring of 1918 was really aimed to try and knock out the Allied lines before the American doughboys ended up getting into the war. And even then you see you know, widespread use of stormtroopers and uh, infantry tactics to be able to break through the uh, lines of both the British and the French. So uh, what they did is they had gotten a lot of the crack troops from different German units. They really spoiled them. I mean, they gave them a lot of great comforts, uh, better training, everything like that. And what they would do is they would move up uh, to the front of the lines, just try and take out anybody that they could in the different trenches. If they came across a tough position, it didn't matter. They'd just go around it and try and find a weaker spot and leave it to the main infantry bodies behind them to go through and clear out these positions. But they were using flamethrowers, which again is nothing new at this time, but really to the scale that they were using these shock troops, uh, that was pretty new. However, Germany really wasn't able to... Uh, get too much ground in their spring offensive in 1918 and what happens later on in 1918 is uh, we see the second battle of Cambrai being part of the larger allied offensive now in the battle of Amiens I hope I'm pronouncing that right because I'm not good with French all I know I'll be honest is je parle français um, but anyway in this battle we see the largest combined uh, arms assault that had ever taken place up to that point. The amount of planning and the use of various weapons together was unprecedented. So like in the Battle of Amiens, uh, there were three lines that they had hoped to be able to cross during their assault. So it, it was like the green line, the red line, and the blue line. And the blue line was eight miles away. So what it called for is uh, artillery being fired 100 yards in front of the infantry as they advance. So a lot closer at that point. But artillery, of course, had gotten better throughout the war. Um, artillery and tanks would go in together. Now, you would also have whippet tanks. Told you I'd get a chance to be able to talk about this. Uh, the whippet tank was uh, it was a speed demon of tanks at the time. Eight miles an hour. Could probably feel the wind at that speed. I don't know if you could. Anyway. So the Whippet tanks were a lot faster, and they would get behind the enemy lines and down back into our artillery positions um, and take those out pretty quick. They were a lot lighter, smaller tanks. Uh, but tanks would advance forward, kind of similar to what we saw in the first battle of Amia or the first battle of Cambrai, and you know with infantry there too. They try and take the first line, and uh, the first wave would stop at the red line, which was that first line, and then the second wave would kind of push through to the green line and hopefully end up get to the red line, which I said was eight miles away and would be the largest single day advance uh, in just about any part of the war. So uh, they're able to go through and really have a lot of success because they were able to coordinate all of these different units really well. Uh, air was even coordinated a lot better too, providing close air support for the infantry as they advance, just kind of mowing down machine gun nests that were easier to spot from the air than they were on land. I mean, even in this this battle too, cyclists were used. Canadian cyclists on their bicycles rode into battle uh, to try to exploit some of the advantages that uh, had been made thanks to the tanks and also the infantry. But what we saw in the first battle of Cambrai was really the turning point in the end of the war because it showed how tanks would work. And having gotten uh, through the Hindenburg line really showed what combined arms were capable of doing and how tactics could change. You know, we know that World War I showed the end of cavalry uh, 
you know, really being used by a lot of large nations on a massive scale. But seeing how this was done was really revolutionary for the time. Because Germany wasn't able to use tanks in the same way, it really put them at a tremendous disadvantage. They did a lot to be able to stop tanks, uh, including having or producing a lot of weapons that would stop them, and again, doing things like changing the size of their trenches. But so much was done to advance warfare during World War I that it really changed how we fight today. Some of the same tactics that were used at the end of World War I were, of course, used in World War II, and uh, many degrees is still even used today. You know, that adaptation to new weapons, new strategies really made the difference, and that's where we kind of see it in this part uh, of World War I, is those tactics really being used to their advantage. Now, of course, Germany having only produced two tanks in the German Panzerwagen, you know, not making too much of an impact in World War I, they learned very quickly from that. We saw in World War II, uh, tanks was not an issue for Germany. Um, but that is going to be this episode here, talking a little bit about the tactics. I'm really excited to be able to continue to go with this series because I'm learning a lot of cool stuff, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I hope that you guys are learning a lot of cool stuff here as well. And it'll make, I think, this uh, series a lot better for you guys. And also, if you get Battlefield 1, hopefully you'll be able to see some of this kind of come through um, as you go ahead and play the game. So I'm just going to go ahead and just get back to my tank and everything like that kind of fix my weapon but thanks for watching you guys war fighters war is hell but you don't have to worry because war fighters i've got your six